Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for, for being here. Merry Christmas to you all as we're filtering in still. Would you stand and, and join us as we worship? Thank you again, and Merry Christmas again to all of you. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us at Appleton Gospel Church. Uh, as we continue our time of worship and our time of celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you are new, you may be visiting, uh, tuning in for the first time. If it's on your heart that you'd like to connect with the church and learn more about us, we would love that. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, if you are uh, tuning in online, if you have your phone, you can go to appletongospel.com slash connect. Or if you're here in person, you can grab a physical connect card at the back table and drop it in the giving box uh, on your way out. And so, again, as we prepare and continue to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, I'd like to share today's scripture reading. That comes from John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's Word. Oh. 
Father God, we come before you this evening in humility and awe of the gift of your son. What you would accomplish through his birth, life, death, and resurrection. And nothing that we did earn that, God, it's just your amazing grace and the love that you have for us. May that just be an encouragement and all the hope and assurance that we need to take the light that you've given and share it with anybody and everybody who will hear it. We thank you again, Father. We pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome everyone and Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, I'm Pastor David and I'm just, I just want to say that whether you're here in the room uh, with us this evening or you're joining us online, I just want to say I'm so glad that you're a part of this church. And uh, especially around Christmas season, the Christmas season, I know life can be chaos and sometimes it can be very difficult and painful depending on what's going on in your life. But uh, what we're trying to do as a church is help provide stability and a true source of hope uh, in a crazy world by sharing good news every week. And I, I truly hope that you experience that today. But as we continue, I just have a couple announcements for you. And the first is this. Uh, we will not have worship in person tomorrow uh, on Christmas Day, uh, but we will be rebroadcasting uh, this service uh, for those who missed it uh, tomorrow morning. So. We will be back next Sunday on, on New Year's Day, and so I hope that uh, no matter what you're doing, I, I plan to see the new year the night before and uh, still come. So I hope that you join me next Sunday as well. Uh, we also have a number of, of great events coming up in the new year, uh, coming up here in January. We have a women's breakfast coming up at the Machine Shed. We have a new financial workshop that we're going to be offering at the end of the month. We have our second annual Great Chili Cook-Off, which I'm very excited about. I, I need to find some sort of trophy, hopefully a little larger than last year for those of you who are around. I ordered it online, and when it came, it was about like that. So it was, it was a, technically a trophy. Um, so we're going to, that's coming up at the end of January. So anyways, if you'd like to see what's coming up uh, here at Appleton Gospel, or if you'd like to register for anything coming up, you can always uh, go to our events page online, um, or you could click on the events tab on our Church Center app if you'd like to as well. Uh, but just, I, I want you to hear my heart for you in this. It's not just that we want to keep you busy. Uh, our heart as a church behind these events and classes and groups and all the different things we do here outside of Sunday morning is we really want you to feel uh, like you belong here. And so if you're new here or, if, or not, if you just feel kind of disconnected, and, and uh, I would just encourage you to uh, maybe see if an event, class, join a group, those things uh, help, will help you certainly feel more uh, connected here and really develop a sense of belonging. Um, second, this evening, uh, I already said this morning once today, so I'm going to try really hard not to do that the rest of the evening, um, so help me out here. But second, as a church, uh, we believe that our financial gifts and offerings are, are a part of our worship. They're an act of worship. The Apostle Paul wrote this, each of you should decide what, you, what uh, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not relu reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So uh, today, if you'd like to give any amount, you can give online uh, through the website. You can give through the Church Center app as well. Um, or if you'd like, you can use there. We have a couple giving boxes on the back wall you can use uh, as you uh, leave the service today. I just want to say thank you so much to those of you who are able to give at any point uh, in the last year, in, in 2022. Uh, as I shared in a, a church uh, update email this past week, a generous church is such a great sign that God is at work and bearing fruit among us. And I, I see that fruit, I see the evidence of that work all the time around here. And I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, so with all that, uh, let's pray as we continue and uh, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for this evening. Thank you that we can gather together as your people. Thank you for the gift of your son Jesus. And it is uh, his birth that we're celebrating here this evening. And so, Lord, I pray that you would fill us uh, with your spirit. I pray that you would fill us with 
a spirit of joy and hope and celebration as we think and remember and honor the incarnation of your son Jesus. Uh, but Lord, I also pray that we would be open and receptive to your word. Even though this is a story that some of us have heard many, many times, I pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, fresh ears to hear of faith so that we might hear your word through this uh, well-known story. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, all year in our preaching ministry, we're focusing on learning the way of Jesus. And so today, we're going to consider, uh, once again, the Christmas story uh, of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, uh, which is when the Son of God was made flesh and humbly made his dwelling among us, when the light of the world dawned on the people living in a land of deep darkness, as the prophet would say. Now, Isaiah also wrote that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And in this, uh, one of the most important chapters in the story of human history, we discover that the one whom God had promised from of old through the prophets, the one who would come to uh, rescue us on a mission to seek and to save the lost from the power of sin and death, he would not be none other than God's own son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, this incredible story, uh, celebrated for about 2,000 years now, relates to our theme of learning the way of Jesus by showing us many things, but certainly that God wasn't content with simply telling us uh, how we ought to live from far off in the safety of heaven. Instead, he was willing to come into our world to leave the comfort and the safety and the glory of heaven and to become a living embodiment of God's presence and power here among us, to become the word of God made flesh in order to provide the only way of salvation. Well, my message to you today in light of the Christmas story is really a call to embody a kingdom of light that is the kingdom of God in a world of darkness. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, if you'd like to follow along, please open to Luke chapter two, starting with verse one. Uh, we'll put the scripture on the screens for you as well, but Luke chapter two, starting with verse one. What we're gonna do is we're gonna read through this. This is the Christmas story. Some of us have family traditions where at some point, some member of the family sits down and opens up a Bible and typically will read this passage of scripture. And I'm very thankful for that tradition. Uh, if you haven't had a tradition like that, maybe you should start one. Uh, at any rate, let's read this together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. This is God's word. Now, I say it all the time, but every time we open the Bible, we should start questioning the Bible. Okay, I am giving you permission to do this. What am I reading? When in history is this taking place? Who is the author of this text? And so on. So uh, let me give you a few uh, bits of information about the context of this before we continue. The Gospel of Luke was written by a man named Luke who became a Christian through the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the first century AD. Now, Luke was a doctor by trade, but he uh, did a careful investigation into the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, Luke did not know Jesus personally, so he had to interview the eyewitnesses, many of whom were still alive in his time, people who had heard what Jesus said and saw what Jesus had done. Now, the gospel according to Luke is the first part of a two-part series or report uh, that Luke Uh, serving as a historian, put together, according to the eyewitnesses. Now, the second part of this two-part series is the book of Acts in the Bible, uh, which I hope to spend some time in uh, in a few months in uh, this theme of learning the way of Jesus. But for now, (laughs) let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's look back at the Christmas story here. Okay, I would love to preach through all of Luke and Acts tonight, but alas, it's just Luke 2, and not even the whole chapter. Anyways, Verse 1, let's start again. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. Now, let's pause here. So these, what might seem to be meaningless details at the start of this uh, account, actually serve to ground what might be mistaken as a mythological story in actual history. Now these things which came to pass actually happened to real people in real places in actual history. None of this is a myth. Remember that there were, this this whole account is based on eyewitness testimony. Now Luke writes that this took place during the reign of Caesar Augustus, uh, the Roman emperor. And a census was decreed for tax purposes, which is lovely. So everyone in Judea had to go to their ancestral homes to be registered for the census. Now, in addition to grounding uh, the birth of Jesus in a particular time and place in history, the census also explains why Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which incidentally is what the prophets had foretold of where the Messiah would be born. Let's keep going, okay, in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, let's pause here again. Now, we know that from the other gospel accounts uh, that first Mary and then Joseph had been told by angelic messengers what was going to happen that Mary, though she was a virgin, would miraculously conceive and give birth to a son, and she would call him Jesus. The angel Gabriel had said, he, referring to Jesus, will be great and will be called the son of the most high. In other words, the son of God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So, Mary, did you know? Yes, yes, Mary knew. Anyways, uh, Mary and her fiancé, Joseph, traveled about 100 miles from Nazareth, uh, a small town in in the northern region of Galilee, uh, which was where they had lived south to Bethlehem in the region of Judea. Now, moms, imagine, if you will, making this long journey on foot or perhaps riding on some sort of animal while you are great with child, while you are very pregnant. Now, Mary did not have an easy assignment here from the Lord, but she was strong and she was faithful. Mary's awesome. 
And I'm sure Joseph was helpful too. He seems like a helpful guy. (laughs) At any rate, verse 6, let's keep going. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Okay, so because of the census, no doubt, Bethlehem, which was an ancient, it was a historic city, uh, known as the city of, of David, an ancient king, it was overflowing with people from out of town. Everybody had come back home Uh, for the census. Now, likely, many extended relatives of Mary and Joseph found themselves sleeping in odd places, maybe on the floor, maybe on a couch while they were there. And Mary and Joseph uh, found room as a result for the delivery of their their child, not in a, a guest house or a sterile hospital bed, but actually in a place normally used to keep animals. And perhaps it was a small cave near Bethlehem laying their newborn son, not in a palace as he deserved, dressed in fine robes, but in a manger and wrapped in swaddling cloths. Humble, as we said last week. But mom and baby were happy and healthy. Uh, There's not much else to report at this point. So this is such a a picture of the humility of Christmas that we talked about last Sunday, and I, I love this picture of the Son of God laid in a manger. But even though Jesus was born in humble circumstances, God the Father couldn't keep things totally quiet. Uh, People needed to know that Jesus, his son, had been born. So look at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, that is Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, according to the Bible, angels are created spiritual beings, created by God to serve as messengers from God to his people and to do other things as well, I believe. Now, just for a moment, uh, on that dark Judean hillside, the veil between heaven and earth was pulled back just for a moment, and the light of the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds. Now just imagine sitting in the quiet darkness, keeping watch over your flocks like you've done a thousand times before, trying not to freak out your sheep, but just making sure they don't wander off and die. Now maybe you're sitting next to a small fire, I probably would have been, trying to keep warm, trying not to fall asleep, when all of a sudden, the host of heaven appears before you. The, the brilliance, the, the splendor, the power of the glory of God appears before you so often uh, envisioned in Scripture as light, radiant light. And you realize, first of all, angels are real. Now, second of all, I'm not sure if that would have been my first thought, maybe. But second, one starts speaking to you, sharing the good news that a rescuer or a savior had been born. He was the Messiah, which means the anointed one or the chosen one, translated as the Christ, the one whom the prophets had foretold. Now, this little one would be the one who would finally deal with the problems of sin and death in the world. But the angel said that it was the Lord himself who had come. Now, to whom did God send this this message to? Think of the characters we have so far in our story. He could have sent this angelic message to Caesar Augustus. He could have sent this message to King Herod, as we looked at last week, to some rich and powerful person. But no, to some humble shepherds in the dark of night, out in the countryside. Now, this message was that God had sent one who would cause great joy for all kinds of people. And the shepherds respond to this message of the angels in a similar way to Mary. They, they had hopeful faith. 
They didn't write it off as a hallucination or laugh about it as a joke. They, they didn't go back to bed. They, they went to see what the angels had told them, had proclaimed to them. Look at verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, we should probably go see, right? Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So it was all true. The shepherds confirmed what the angels had said. They found the the young parents and the, the Christ child and started spreading the word about him and what they had seen and what they had heard about him. Now, isn't it fitting, I would say, that God would choose shepherds to bear this news? Now, shepherds in their day were solidly blue collar guys, (laughs) <laughs> Not necessarily shameful or, uh, you know, largely well-respected, just normal guys, probably a little rough around the edges, maybe like some of you here today. But God, in his wisdom, chose them to receive the message about his son, and he drew them to himself. Now, of course, this is a pattern that we see throughout the Bible. The Apostle Paul would write, that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And so it it just fits that God would choose the shepherds to know. Well, let's finish the story with verse 20 and 21. The shepherds returned back to the sheep, presumably, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And so, my friends, this is the surprising and the joyful story of the first Christmas, an event that Christians have been celebrating ever since, and I believe will celebrate forever in the future. But what does this story mean for us today? How do we apply the Christmas story to our lives? Well, there are many, many things which the Christmas story reveals to us about who God is or about what God has done or God's heart for us, who we are, our identity, our calling in Christ. But I'm just going to give you one today. I trust we'll get to Christmas again next year, and I'll give you another one then. But for tonight... Christmas means that we must be willing to move in to. Christmas means we must be willing to move in to. So even though this is a broken world, and this world is passing away, and even though our home is in heaven and we eagerly await the return of our Savior from there, and even though we could be described here and now as pilgrims or even as exiles, as Christians in the world today. The story of Emmanuel, of God with us, the story of the the incarnation of the Son of God, of, of his leaving heaven for us, that as Eugene Peterson wrote, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. This Christmas story means for all of us who are learning to follow the way of Jesus, that we must at least be willing to move in as well. Move in where? Well, where did Jesus move? Jesus saw our greatest need. He saw our brokenness. He saw the immaturity and the doubts. He saw the sin and the struggle. And he came. He moved in from heaven to earth, from a kingdom of light to a kingdom of darkness. Therefore, Christmas means we must be willing to move in too. To move where? I believe to move toward the needs of others, to move closer into relationships, 
to put down roots as we can and move into the neighborhood to become more deeply enmeshed within our schools and within our workplaces, within the city, or wherever in the world we find ourselves. If God's own son was willing to do this for us, and so much more, to live the perfect life, a life without sin, but then to die on the cross for the sins of the world, to be buried, but on the third day to rise again from the dead, should we not at least be open to or willing to move a little closer to others as well? But why? Why should we do this? Well, again, because of why Jesus was willing to come. Because of his great love for us because of his compassion for us, because he looked at us and had mercy for us. He came to love and to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. And there was no way for him to do that remotely. He had to be near. He had to be God with us. Think of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa could not have done her life's work which clearly was motivated by her Christian faith, of serving the poor and the dying people in India and elsewhere around the world from the comfort of somewhere else. She needed to be in Calcutta. She needed to be with people to pray for them, to serve them, and to encourage others to do the same. Think of Martin Luther King Jr. He could not have done his life's work which again was motivated by his Christian faith, advocating for justice and liberty for black people from the safety of the North or another country. He needed to be in Alabama. He needed to be there to march. He needed to be near. But if Jesus was willing to move in for us because of his love for us, do you think it's possible that the command to love your neighbor as yourself will require, at times, for us to leave the comfort of our homes or the safety of our relationships or the ideal of our preferences or our opinions? I think the answer is yes. In fact, I'd say it's a requirement for Christians. And the reason is this, because very simply, Christmas proves that this is the way of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that we all need to become Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr., The results of their lives are truly exceptional. But my point is that the way that they live their lives by incarnation or moving in is the normal means for all Christians. But second, and very practically, because people rarely really let you in until they see that they can trust you and that you are committed to a relationship with them for the long run. If people think that you're trying to manipulate them or that you are only interested in them because of what you'll get out of it, they will trust you as much as they trust a politician trying to represent them when they actually live in a different district. They'll assume that you'll run away or you'll move away as soon as things get tough. So they won't let us in, even if they are desperate in need of help. And I wouldn't blame them. But if, on the other hand, we are willing to move toward others, as Jesus moved in toward us, then we have the incredible, God-glorifying opportunity to embody the light of God's kingdom in a world of darkness. Not only do we have the opportunity to just tell people the good news about Jesus, but to live it, to breathe it, to incarnate it, the gospel. Now, of course, not as a perfect example and not as some sort of replacement for Jesus, but as a living example of what it looks like for a regular person like you or like me to live life in God's kingdom. Now, I recognize that it's much easier to say all these things than it is to do these things. It is one of the hardest things in the world to actually love people to love people who are wired very different than we are or who have very different opinions or preferences or beliefs than we have. 
It is very hard to love people who sometimes say or do very hurtful things to us. But again, this is the way of Jesus. And really, this is the story of Christmas. When God moved into the neighborhood to dwell with us, to be with us, to love and serve us, and ultimately to save us by his grace. The angels sang, the shepherds worshiped and told people what happened, and the world was never the same. So tonight, may we too be willing to move in whenever and wherever and to whomever God might send us. May we be willing to embody the light of his kingdom and the wonderful news of his son Jesus out into the, this world of darkness. They need it, and so do we. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world to live and die and rise again. We thank you and we give you the glory, honor, and praise. Lord Jesus, thank you for modeling for us what it looks like to live a life of incarnation, of coming in, of moving in, of becoming one of us so that you might save us. Lord Jesus, I pray this Christmas, but throughout all of this year, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit so that we would be people who are in, live an incarnate life as well. Forgive us, Lord, when we become self-centered or selfish with our time, our money, our resources. Help us, Lord, empower us. Give us the strength and courage and the wisdom to be able to put roots down and love and serve the people around us, the people in our path, with everything that we have for your glory, for their benefit, and Father, for our joy. Oh God, thank you for inviting us into this work that you're doing in this world. We love you and we praise you and we pray all this in the name of Jesus, whom we celebrate tonight. Amen. As we finish our service uh, today, just like to invite, if you could grab, there's a lighter here and a lighter there. We're gonna do a little candlelight uh, rendition of Silent Night. If you could uh, light a candle and pass the flame around. If you could, parents, be careful with your children and fire. Um, and then also, if you need a, a candle, if you could grab one nearby or Leah in the back has some extras. If you wanna just raise your hand, she'll get one to you. When you're ready, you can stand and we'll sing together.
Well, we'll close with a benediction or blessing from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas to you all. Please go in peace today.